welcome to the Stroke Recovery Group. I'm so glad you're here. Hey there, I'm so glad you're back with me for another I Care For Your Brain Stroke Recovery Group brought to you by the Foundation of First Health. My name is Dr. Karen Sullivan and I am a neuropsychologist. Very happy to be with you here today. Before we get started on rule number nine, we're gonna go through a recap on rule number eight, acknowledge your trauma. In that session, I invited you to think about the possibility that you may be living with some degree of traumatic stress from your stroke. A stroke is a psychologically stressful event and even traumatic for many. One in four people after a stroke develop post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress symptoms. Unresolved trauma can cause stuck points. These are negative beliefs in the area of safety, trust, power, esteem, and intimacy, and they can weigh down your recovery. Post-traumatic growth, in contrast, can provide us with an opportunity for personal growth, making us an even better version of ourselves. And the question I posed to you in rule number eight was, do I consider my stroke to be a psychologically traumatic event? We went through the definition of a trauma, which is any experience that involves the threat of death or serious injury, particularly when sudden or unexpected, and that results in intense feelings of fear and or helplessness. We went through the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and we specifically applied them to stroke. We went through possible re-experiencing symptoms of nightmares or feeling triggered by smells, sights, sounds of things that remind you of stressful parts of your stroke experience. We talked about feeling hyper aroused, keyed up, on edge, feeling like you're always waiting for another stroke to happen. We talked about being easily startled, feeling like you can't relax. Symptoms of avoidance can happen after a stroke when we don't want to talk about it. We try really hard to push specific memories, thoughts, feelings associated with the stroke out of our mind completely. We talked about when stroke affects the way you think about yourself, the world, and other people. Strong negative feelings like your life is over now, you're never gonna be the same, being unable to imagine the new you post-stroke. What I encourage you to think about is that traumatic stress symptoms happen on a spectrum. Some of you may have listened to that session and thought, well, I could see a little bit of myself here. For some of you, it might have really struck home and you, you had to come to Jesus realizing how much work you need to do to work through this part of your recovery. We talked about post-traumatic growth, which is coming out on the way other side of trauma after you've gone through quite the healing journey. Trauma, as hard as it can be to experience, can provide us with the opportunity for personal growth, making us even better versions of ourselves than we were before. And I asked you to consider the possibility that the stroke could increase your sense of meaningfulness, satisfaction, and fulfillment in life. So now let's move on to rule number nine. This is insisting on follow-up care, developing a system to keep your long-term recovery on track. In the first few weeks or months after your stroke, you should have received the most intensive care and rehabilitation. This is good because the sooner you receive medical intervention, the better you're gonna do in the long-term. Follow-up care is needed after a stroke for two main reasons, and this is the focus of our time together today. Prevention of another stroke through behavior change, things you can do yourself and working alongside your doctors to reduce the likelihood of having another stroke, and long-term recovery. The key to behavior change, psychologists know, is the meaning of why we do things. This is the key factor to getting and staying motivated. When we first met together in session one, I encouraged you to identify your why. I want you to go back to this. Remind yourself of why you're participating in this stroke recovery group. Why do you show up every day in this recovery to do your very best? I want you to believe deep down that you can make changes. Your efforts will not be in vain. 
I want you to set positive goals for yourself, saying what you will do instead of saying what you won't do. And make it fun. We talked about this in our creativity rule. We don't want this recovery to be stagnant, all hard work. We have to build some playfulness and some spontaneity into this recovery. And using a buddy system is a scientifically backed way to make a change in your behavior. So like I was saying before, the first reason we want you to insist on follow-up care is for stroke prevention. 23% of you statistically will have a second stroke if you don't make significant health changes. In-person discussions with your medical providers that emphasize evidence-based stroke prevention measures are one of the most powerful ways to improve the health of your vascular system and to reduce the risk of another stroke. I wanna take some time right now to talk to you about our two major circulatory systems in the body. The first one is the cardiovascular system, and then we're gonna talk about the cerebrovascular system. So our cardiovascular system is the body's network of blood vessels that includes arteries, veins, and capillaries that carry the blood to and from our heart. We cut off the cardiovascular system right about here, right at our internal carotid arteries. Above that is the cerebrovascular system. Both of these vascular systems are responsible for the circulation, the transportation of nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, glucose, all the important things we need in order to live and thrive. The circulatory system provides nourishment, fights disease, stabilizes temperature, helps us to maintain homeostasis, and carries off waste. Healthy blood vessels are elastic and can expand and contract to meet the demands of our environment. In the cerebrovascular system, which again, just starts at our internal carotid arteries and goes up into the brain, has two major blood vessel systems that supply the back's front and back part of the brain. The internal carotid arteries are about the width of our pointer fingers, and they supply the front part of the brain. The vertebral arteries in the back are about the size of our pinky fingers, and these supply the back part of the brain and the brainstem. Blood flow from the front and back of our brain is joined together in something called the circle of Willis. And this is very important to know because this means that the front and back parts of our brain have backup. There's redundancy built into this system. This is why some people can live with no symptoms at all from a completely clogged internal carotid artery because they're able to get back flow from this circle, other parts of the system. Unfortunately, the middle part of the brain doesn't work like this. It's not set up this way. This part of the brain is supplied by many, many very small blood vessels. These are about the diameter of a piece of hair. And you can kind of think of them like one-way streets. There's no other blood vessels that come in and provide backup if we get a clog in the system there. Brain cells can only store their fuel for about four to six minutes. The most important fuels, of course, being oxygen and glucose. So one of the things you really need to prioritize as you live your life after the stroke is the health of your vascular system. We wanna make sure that your brain cells are always getting a steady supply of those two critical important fuels of oxygen and glucose. They can only hold their own fuels for between four and six minutes. So we really wanna prioritize making sure that we always have a nice, steady supply of blood flow to the brain. Your post-stroke health goals should be related to the healthy blood flow to your brain. And I want you to look at these cute little guys here. And remember that open elastic blood vessels are happy blood vessels. There is one intervention that has the most scientific evidence to promote healthy blood flow to the brain. Can you guess what it is? It's more physical activity. This doesn't mean you have to become a super marathon runner. This simply means we want you to move more and more each day than you did the day before. I want you to understand just how powerful exercise is. It has significant direct, but also indirect effects. So we all know after we're able to exercise that we feel a certain way, okay? And this is where we're gonna look at our indirect effects. So we know that exercise improves mood. We have a better night's sleep when we exercise. We can cope better. We have less anxiety. Our pain tolerance increases. We feel better about ourselves, our self-esteem takes a nice boost, and it reduces fatigue. These are all things that we want you to prioritize after you've had a stroke. Now let's talk about those direct effects. Some of these I bet you have never heard of before. 
We know that when people exercise regularly, they have a reduction in blood pressure. They have a reduction in the bad cholesterol. We're gonna to get to that in a few slides. There is an increase in the good cholesterol. There's an increase in insulin sensitivity. We reduce insulin resistance. We reduce inflammation in the whole body, including the brain. We have a reduction in body weight, which can be very helpful in blood flow, making sure that we're getting as much of that rich oxygenated blood to the brain. It improves the body's ability to take in and use oxygen. Now these two final ones, I want you to really listen because this is not only fascinating, but very important information. Regular exercise helps to improve health of existing brain cells and get this, even helps to grow new brain cells. And remember, neuroplasticity is the name of the game. That's why we're here. We want those remaining brain cells to be working to their best ability and we want you to be able to grow new brain cells. I want you to know your personal risk factors for stroke and reduce them by following evidence-based recommendations and your doctor's advice. So you might remember this from a previous rule, we went through the top four reasons that people have their strokes. And I want you to understand exactly what are the most modern up-to-date recommendations from brain scientists who study these conditions. We're gonna talk about hypertension or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, and atrial fibrillation. So what I want you to do is look at this picture of a blood vessel on my slide. Hypertension, also called high blood pressure, is when we have a reading of 140 over 90 or higher. So if you look in this blood vessel here, it's gonna explain two very important things. The number on top of a blood pressure reading is called the systolic pressure. This is measured between when the heart contracts. The number on the bottom is the diastolic pressure, and this is measured between beats when the heart is relaxing. It's very important to me that you look at this blood vessel and see even how much prehypertension can narrow the passageway for blood to get into your brain. When blood vessels are healthy, they are wide open with no obstructions. And remember, they're relatively elastic. They can contract or expand depending on what we're doing. So I want you to look here at this blood vessel and see when the blood vessel is of normal health. Look how much of that blood flow can happen. But look, even when we get into prehypertension, we already have a significant narrowing of the blood vessel. But now let's move all the way into a diagnosis of hypertension. Look how much less blood flow we are getting through that blood vessel. That is not what we want for those of you who have lived through a stroke. Hypertension is the single strongest predictor of all known risk factors for stroke. And here's where the hope comes in. Even very small improvements significantly reduce your chance of having a second stroke. I want you to get the most accurate readings you can when you get your blood pressure taken, so here's a few science-based tips. I want you to use an automated blood pressure machine. You're going to put the cuff on your bare arm. It needs to entirely cover your arm circumference, not too small, not too big. I want you to sit in a chair with good back support and put both of your feet firmly on the ground. I want your legs to be uncrossed and your arms to be supported. I want you to have your bladder emptied and I don't want you to talk. These are recommendations from the American Medical Association. If your blood pressure is more than 140 over 90, they recommend that you take it again to make sure it's an accurate read. If your blood pressure is significantly elevated, which is considered to be over 200 over 120, this is a medical emergency and is associated with the risk of a hemorrhagic stroke, and I want you to go immediately to urgent care or the hospital. If you're prescribed medication for blood pressure, I want you to take it perfectly. Even missing a day or two can have significant consequences. I want you to buy a cuff of your own and keep a log of your daily blood pressure readings at least twice a day, if not three, and share them with your doctor. What you're really looking for there is that we don't want significant ebbs or flows. We want you to relatively stay within the same area. Lifestyle modification is the first line of antihypertensive treatment. I want you to follow the 2020 recommendations from the International Society of Hypertension Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines. And I'm gonna go through a lot of them with you here. 
I want you to be mindful of your diet. What is it you put into your body every day? Eating a diet that is rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, polyunsaturated fat, and dairy products, and reducing foods that you eat that are high in sugar, saturated fat, and trans fats, a lot of these recommendations can be found either in the DASH diet or the MIND diet. And we've talked about that a little bit before, the Mediterranean Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay Diet. Increasing intake of vegetables that are high in nitrates are known to reduce blood pressure. This would include things like leafy vegetables and beetroot. Other beneficial foods and nutrients can include those high in magnesium, calcium, and potassium, things like avocado, nuts, seeds, and beans. Moderate consumption of drinks like coffee, green tea, hibiscus tea, pomegranate juice, and beetroot juice and cocoa are recommended in moderate doses for the reduction of blood pressure. It's important to reduce salt in your food while you're cooking and while you're at the table. I want you to avoid or limit your consumption of things like soy sauce, fast foods, processed food, things like bread, cereals are actually quite high in salt. Try to use fresh herbs in place of salt for seasoning. The next one is weight reduction. I want you to particularly focus on abdominal fat. This has been highly associated with a second stroke and blood pressure. Getting regular physical activity is very important, not only aerobic activity, but also resistance exercise. We think that this is both beneficial for the prevention and the treatment of hypertension. Moderate intensity aerobic exercise, like walking, jogging, cycling, yoga, and swimming for 30 minutes a day, five to seven times per week is recommended. Also strength training can help reduce blood pressure. Doing resistance and strength training two to three times a week is recommended. Now, obviously that's not possible given the variety of stroke deficits that folks live with. Trying to adapt those to your personal recommendation is recommended. Reducing stress and inducing a state of mindfulness in yourself has been shown to improve blood pressure, especially later in life. Stress should be reduced and mindfulness or meditation should be introduced into your daily practice. Reducing exposure to the elements has recently come out as an important way to manage hypertension. And what this means is avoiding air pollution as much as you can and reducing extreme cold temperatures. There are three foods that are known to fight hypertension nicely. These include whole grain and high fiber breakfast cereals, low sugar, low salt, of course, flax seeds and blueberries. Let me share with you a little bit of the research support for these three foods. In a 2016 study, this reduced the chance of developing high blood pressure or reduced it in the mild to moderate stages by 20%. Dietary flaxseed resulted in a powerful reduction in blood pressure in patients with peripheral artery disease. And blueberries, which get quite a lot of attention for their brain benefits, were shown in a 2015 study of women ages 45 to 65 with high blood pressure. Half of them ate the equivalent of a cup of blueberries every day for eight weeks, and the other half didn't eat the blueberries. The blueberry group's systolic blood pressure dropped five points, and the placebo group did not change at all. The next risk factor that we're gonna talk about is high cholesterol. High density lipoprotein, also called HDL, is the good kind of cholesterol and the kind that you want to be high. In contrast, low density lipoproteins, also called LDL, is the bad stuff and the kind that we want to be low. With high LDL, that's the bad stuff, we can develop fatty deposits in the blood vessels. Once they build up, these deposits narrow the blood's ability to flow through the arteries. Sometimes these deposits can break off and form a clot that causes a stroke. High ADL protects against an ischemic stroke by helping move the bad kind of cholesterol to the liver and out of the bloodstream, helping to keep the existing plaques in place on the blood vessel wall. The higher your levels of HDL, the more protection you have against another stroke. Greater benefits come from HDL levels over 60, 
and HDL levels below 35 can add to your stroke risk. So I hope you're asking yourself, how can I increase my HDL? Well, almost all of it has to do with your diet and some of it has to do with your movement. So what are the things you can incorporate into your diet every day to try to get this HDL up higher? You can eat more heart healthy fats, things like olive oil, avocado oil, eat more fruit with high fiber, things like prunes, apples, and pears. Eating small fish can increase the omega-3 fatty acids in your blood, which is excellent for getting your HDL up. It's been advised to actually eat the fish. A supplement is better than nothing, but you will get more of the whole foods benefit when you actually eat the fish. And the type of fish that they encourage you to eat, like I said, are those small ones. So not necessarily the salmon. Things like mackerel, sardines, anchovies, all those little smelly, oily fish. Eating avocados, eating oatmeal, increasing your physical activity. And just this year in 2020, a new research study that came out suggested that we can get our HDL up by practicing yoga. When you have high cholesterol, it's really important that you know your numbers. Adults over the age of 20 should have their cholesterol measured at least every five years. And this is because early intervention is key. Vascular disease typically builds very slowly in the arteries, the veins over time. We wanna to try to be as on top of it and in front of it as we possibly can. Again, sticking to a healthy diet. Now in terms of cholesterol, it's really important to get those saturated fats low and those trans fats even lower. We want you to really focus on mono unsaturated fats, things like nuts, uh, olive oil, seeds, polyunsaturated fats from things like fish oil, canola oil, and really trying to focus on water soluble fiber, things like oats, beans, and lentils. It's really important that you eat less processed foods. Specifically, we want you to be avoiding high sodium foods and incorporating more vegetables, fruits, and whole grains into your diet. An evidence-based recommendation for high cholesterol, once again, is exercise. Now, this recommendation comes from the American Heart Association, and they recommend 40 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise three to four times a week to get your cholesterol levels into the healthy range. Maintaining your weight and focusing on losing weight in a healthy way if you need to has been recommended. Losing just five to 10% of your body fat can make a significant difference in your cholesterol levels and lower that risk factor for another stroke. And I don't want you to count on medications alone. It's really important that you work to make these lifestyle changes along with keeping the medication regimen that's been prescribed to you by your physician. I wanna take a moment to talk about statins. I get lots of questions as a neuropsychologist about statins. Statins are the most prescribed drug in the United States. They lower your risk of having another stroke and may reduce the severity of another stroke if one happens. By reducing levels of LDL, the bad stuff, statins help prevent plaque formation and in turn stroke. Large research studies have shown clear ties between the use of statins and decreasing stroke risk. Statin use reduces stroke risk by 21%. And for every 10% reduction in your LDL levels, this will result in a reduction of 15.6% in your chances of having another stroke. Pretty significant. Statins also help by stabilizing plaque deposits within blood vessels, making them more resistant to rupture. When a plaque ruptures, pieces of the plaque break free and are carried away into the bloodstream where they can lodge in the arteries that supply oxygen to the brain. We know that statins also reduce inflammation in the brain. Remember, inflammation makes blood vessels smaller and is harder for the blood to get through. So now let's talk about possible cognitive side effects from statins. I get asked this question all the time. This is a controversial topic in part because in 2012, the FDA came out and said, hey, let's get a committee together on this. We're concerned that we're hearing a lot of complaints about short-term memory loss. They took about five years of researching to come to their conclusion, which came out in a statement in 2017. Unfortunately, the statement said they were unable to reach a conclusion and this remains an open topic for debate. Statins are potentially responsible for reversible short-term cognitive impairment 
and a decreased risk of dementia, specifically in Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia when taken in everyday life. There have been complaints between certain statins and short-term memory symptoms, with the memory symptoms reversing after the medication had been stopped. This caused scientists to look into the two different types of statins to see if maybe this was part of the problem. And we break down statins into two different kinds. We have lipophilic statins and we have hydrophilic statins. Lipophilic statins cross more readily across the blood-brain barrier as compared with hydrophilic statins and are therefore more likely to cause the cognitive symptoms. This was determined in about 2018. So I want to show you some examples of lipophilic versus hydrophilic statins so you can make decisions for yourself with your doctor. So in the lipophilic category, this is the one that more readily crosses into the brain. We have Lipitor or atorvastatin, Zocor or Simvastatin, and Mevacor, also called Lovastatin. In the hydrophilic area, we have Pravacol, also called Pravastatin, and Crestor, called Ruvastatin. A higher dose of the lipophilic statins is going to mean that there's more of those molecules crossing over into the blood-brain barrier. And here's the problem. These medications work very effectively. The brain needs fat. The insulation between our brain cells is called myelin. And this is how transmissions happen between brain cells. It's how our brain cells communicate. And when we don't have enough fat in the brain, people report symptoms of short-term memory loss, also feeling kind of foggy and, and mentally just not as sharp. Overall though, my thoughts are that the positive effects of statins, specifically when it comes to stroke prevention, whether it's a first stroke or a second stroke, are thought to outweigh any negative possible effects. Statins have also been associated with a decreased risk of developing dementia, specifically Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, when taken in midlife. Now we're going to go on to our next risk factor of diabetes. When blood sugars are poorly controlled, insulin levels are imbalanced and inflammation occurs, narrowing those arteries. Because our brain cells can't store their fuel, remember we talked about that before, and in this case specifically glucose, they depend on the bloodstream to deliver a steady, constant supply. High and low spikes in blood sugar are particularly harmful to brain cells. And when we get really concerned is when blood sugar levels go below 80 or above 200. The part of the brain where we make new memories called the hippocampus is susceptible to damage as a result of dramatic blood sugar changes. When you look at the evidence-based recommendations for diabetes, you're gonna see the following. The first thing is to work closely with your doctor to set goals for your blood sugar levels. We want you to be involved with your treatment planning. You're gonna to need to choose a diet that works for you, something that you're actually gonna stick with. The most important factor is to find a medically approved diet that works for you. Again, the MIND diet comes to mind, the DASH diet. Please ask your doctor if you can get a consultation with a nutritionist if you're finding it hard to make better food choices on your own. Monitor your blood glucose levels daily and your A1Cs when you go to the doctor every few months in a log. We want you to really focus on any of those highs or lows, remember under 80 or over 200. We want you to participate in as much physical activity as you can on a regular basis. Again, you need to follow prescription medication regimens as closely as you can. And the final evidence-based recommendation is to stop smoking or using tobacco products. Now we're gonna to go to the final risk factor of atrial fibrillation, sometimes called AFib. This is the rapid irregular beating of the left atrium, the upper chamber of the heart. It's the most common arrhythmia in adults. These rapid contractions of the heart are weaker than normal contractions and result in a slow flow of blood into the atrium. The blood can pool and become sluggish and result in a blood clot. If a blood clot leaves the heart and travels to the brain, it can cause a stroke by blocking the flow of blood through the cerebral arteries. AFib increases your risk of stroke by four to five times on average. 
Treating individuals with a blood thinner like warfarin, there's a few new ones on the market, reduces the risk of stroke for those who have AFib by approximately one half to two thirds. The other evidence-based recommendations for AFib are talking with your doctor about this risk factor. Some people have been told they have AFib, but they haven't really followed through. They're not really on a medicine. They haven't had an evaluation for a pacemaker. We want you to talk with your doctor if you should be on a blood thinner or maybe even an aspirin daily. Again, the recommendation for regular physical activity is made again with AFib. We want you to follow a heart healthy diet. We want you to make your blood pressure a priority. Again, tracking it with a log is critical. I want you to avoid excessive amounts of alcohol or caffeine if you have AFib, maintain a healthy weight, and again, no smoking, no use of tobacco products. But here's the problem with all of these risk factors that we just talked about. Very rarely do they happen in isolation. Once you have one, you're pretty much set up for developing another type of risk factor. And when you have more than two, it makes each of the other ones more difficult to control. And there can be a downward spiral of more and more physical and cognitive impairment, which makes it harder to manage the vascular conditions, increasing their negative effects. So as soon as you are diagnosed with one of these risk factors, I would really love for you to take it very serious and try to get on top of it as much as you can. There is a cumulative effect over time when we don't manage these risk factors. And I wanted to show you that in a visual picture to really drive this point home. So what I want you to do here is look at these four different blood vessels. And you can see that slowly over time when there are issues like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, what we see over time is more and more buildup within the arterial walls. We see less and less space for the blood flow to get through. We see more and more plaques building up. And over time, you can see how little blood is actually getting through. Remember, this is the blood that's carrying the fuel to your brain. Brain. The smallest blood vessels are at greatest risk of damage from any of these risk factors. So why is that? Well, they're just smaller in diameter. They are less elastic already by virtue of being small. And they're the end of the road. There is less chance for compensation from nearby blood flow. And the smallest blood vessels in the whole body are found in the heart, the eyes, the kidneys, the feet, and in the brain. So what happens when we don't have good blood flow to the brain over time? Well, we have a spectrum of cerebrovascular disease. Remember, cerebrovascular is the blood supply to your brain. So at first, what we can see as these vascular changes make the blood vessels more and more narrow and more and more disease builds up, we can see something called chronic ischemic white matter disease. We can then transition into something called vascular cognitive impairment. And at the end of the line, we can develop vascular dementia. A lot of these terms are probably new to you, so I wanna go in and describe them as best I can. Chronic ischemic white matter disease goes by many names. You may hear it called small vessel disease, white matter disease, leukoner infarction, leukokaryosis, perivascular white matter disease of aging. It goes by many, many names. But all you need to know about it is that it's the teeny tiniest, most small in diameter blood vessels that support that inner part of our brain. So if you look at my picture here of a slice of the brain and look where my two red arrows are, I want you to see those four or five kind of uh, diagonal blood vessels. And what I want you to notice is that they're all on their own. They're not touching any other blood vessels. So once they are clogged up, once they are damaged, once they break off, that's it. And we lose brain functioning in that part of the brain that was supplied by those blood vessels. This is an irreversible injury to brain cells that is from reduced blood flow. Chances are many of you have undergone neuroimaging as part of your stroke recovery journey. This can be an MRI of the brain, a CT scan of the head. And I wanna help you understand that a finding of chronic ischemic white matter disease is relatively common. I want you to take a look at these brain scans here to understand that it often happens across stages. We have a brain here in the middle that has a relatively mild 
level of white matter disease. You can literally see the white marks there on the brain scan. And if you look over to the far right, we can see more of a moderate or severe presentation. The severity of the white matter disease dictates if we get any cognitive symptoms from it. We know that a severe degree of white matter disease is related to stroke risk and cognitive impairments. Our heart and our brain can handle decreasing blood flow for a long time without any outward symptoms. So we're still on that spectrum of cerebrovascular disease. Our next area is something that we call vascular cognitive impairment. This is when you have more impairment now cognitively than you did before, perhaps even before your stroke, but it's not at the level of dementia. Mild cognitive symptoms that go along with this condition include difficulty with rapid recall, reduced planning and organization, mild imbalance, a lack of interest or motivation, this can look like depression sometimes, and poor bladder control. This person is still independent in everyday life in the three most important areas we look at as neuropsychologists. This is driving, remembering to take your medications every day, and managing money, managing complex finances. This is oftentimes related to that chronic ischemic white matter disease. We can have direct damage from that white matter disease because parts of the brain aren't getting any blood flow, or we can have indirect damage because another part of the brain that's intricately related to that part of the brain on a circuit is no longer working well. We then can progress into something called vascular dementia. After a stroke, about one third of people develop vascular dementia. This is the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. This is when a person has significant cognitive symptoms that interfere with those three areas of everyday life, the driving, medications, and finances. The symptoms of vascular dementia are gonna depend on the part of the brain that was affected by the stroke and to what extent. As we talk about insisting on follow-up care, one of the most important things, the most important lessons to have learned is that time is brain. And what we mean by this is we want you to be an expert in spotting any signs of another stroke because the sooner you get to medical care, the better you are going to be. We used to use the acronym FAST, and this is what most people think of today when they consider stroke symptoms. F meaning face, we often think about one side of the face drooping. A meaning arms, difficulty using a hand. S meaning speech, having difficulty getting our words out. And T, most important thing is time, remembering to call an ambulance or get to the hospital right away. Unfortunately, this had us leaving behind a lot of our stroke community that had what we call posterior strokes more in the back part of their brain. I mentioned this group before. These are often folks who struggle with balance issues or eye movement issues. And this is why it's so important that we promote the updated acronym of BFAST, B for balance and E for eyes. The second reason we really need you to insist on long-term care is for your long-term recovery of function. Additional rehab, even several years after you've had your stroke, has been shown to make a difference. Debunking the myth that recovery only happens within a one-year window, it's simply not true. Do not accept limited therapy. You deserve therapy for as long as you feel you would benefit from it. You're going to need to advocate for this. Unfortunately, we have time limits, session limits that often go along with insurance-based rehab. And that's why sometimes you might need to BYOB. What this means is if you run out of options in your healthcare system, remember you can always better your own brain. Follow-up appointments can be overwhelming at first. Knowing which doctors you need to see and on what schedule you're gonna see these providers after a stroke can be overwhelming. Develop a system to keep track of your appointments and ask someone you trust to remind you of the most important ones. I want you to try to work with an engaged team, a group of people that are passionate about your care and your future and your recovery and passionate about the expertise that they bring to you. 
Most importantly, please be an active participant in your care. We've talked about the importance of personalizing the therapies that you do. Speak up, tell them your opinions, tell them what you would like to do more of, the things that you're finding difficult. We don't want you to be a passive recipient of your rehab. You deserve a team with a plan, someone who can be your quarterback, someone who can see the big picture. Your neurologist, a neuropsychologist, or a physical medicine and rehab doctor called a physiatrist are your very best bets for developing a long-term comprehensive care recovery plan. When you go to your medical appointments, you have three jobs. The first one is you need to communicate well. The second one is to listen. And the third one is to receive a next step care plan. So let's go through those three in detail. Communicating means being prepared and explaining in the very best detail you can what is happening to you so your doctor understands where you're at in your recovery. Remember, no two brains are the same, no two strokes are the same, and no two stroke recoveries are the same. Bring in written questions to ask. Ask those close to you, what is it that you should ask the doctor? Sometimes we can have a bit of a white coat syndrome and we get in front of a doc and we start to forget our questions and we can get kind of caught up in the moment. These follow-up care appointments are critical to your success and I want you to go in prepared. The next one is to listen. Listening to the recommendations of medical experts is important. If you don't understand a word that they use or what they're saying, what they're trying to tell you, I want you to ask them to try to say it again or another way. Take notes or ask the doctor to, so that way you can reference the information later. And the third one is to receive a next step care plan. You should leave every appointment knowing what the provider thinks you should work on next in order to keep your recovery going. If a referral needs to be placed for this next step, make sure you ask for that. Always leave with another follow-up appointment with that provider if you still feel that there's more to discuss. You might have to ask for this specifically. So to help you developing your system for keeping all of this organized, we have included an appointment tracker in the I Care For Your Brain Interactive Stroke Recovery Guide, which you have access to as part of this program. This will help you remember the date you went, the provider you saw, help you record the questions that you have, help you remember exactly what they said your progress is, and specifically what were those next steps and what were the goals for recovery that were identified in the meeting. Let's leave our time together today with another self-empowerment statement. And remember, I love the idea of you saying this along with me. I deserve follow-up care and I will do all I can to improve the blood flow in my brain. Believe it or not, we're wrapping up next time with rule number 10. We're gonna talk about the transformational power of acceptance. This is where all the information I've shared with you comes together and we're really gonna try to get at the peak of our feeling of empowerment so we can continue on in the stroke recovery journey feeling strong and capable. I'll see you all next time and thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye.